All right, I think we'll officially get started now. Thanks again to those of you who are joining us from whatever time zone and whatever location you're joining us from. We're so glad you decided to take this hour and spend it learning uh, about the launch of Home Builders Can. We've got a, a great lineup of activities for you today. Really excited to be able to share this with you. So we have uh, a little bit on our agenda today. I'll just go through that quickly so you know what to expect. We're going to start. I'm going to introduce the Home Builders Can program to you, what it's about, why we're doing it. Then we'll shift to having Tracy Hun give uh, an overview of the air tightness study we did looking at the effects of air tightness on both energy performance and embodied carbon. And then the part that I know I'm really looking forward to is the panel discussion with our excellent uh, set of panelists here, Paula Melton from Building Green, Beverly Craig from Mass CEC, Eric Whirling from Home Innovation Strategies, and Andrew Guido from Empire Communities. And we'll have a, a great discussion about why embodied carbon in home building is important to uh, all of these folks from their own perspectives, and a discussion on you know, how home builders can, can help and what home builders can sort of do to address this. So without further ado, we will get into the topic at hand, which is why focus on embodied carbon? Uh, I have to say, as somebody who's been working in this field for about 15 years now, it's really kind of surprising to me how quickly the, the conversation has started to you know, filter from uh, a handful of people doing research kind of on the, the fringes of the building industry to embodied carbon being a topic that is um, on a lot of people's minds. And I think for good reason, uh, one of the, the studies that we did here at RMI, looking at trying to estimate the, the emissions from materials from new homes in the United States, gives us at least a, a decent sense of the scale that you know if we are um, incurring embodied carbon emissions at the rate that the studies seem to say for new homes, and we're building uh, about uh, just shy of 2 billion square feet of new homes annually in the US, those homes are going to be responsible for somewhere between 26 to 39 million tons of emissions. And that means that emissions from home building materials are on the scale of the entire emissions for whole countries in other parts of the world, places like Denmark, Bahrain, Ireland. Our emissions from making new homes are the same at the same scale as those entire countries. So, you know, as a place to intervene as a as a major source of emissions, I think you know numbers like this make it really clear that this is something that we need to be focusing on, and hence home builders can to to try to help with that. Now we just put this slide into the deck uh, earlier this morning um, because yesterday there was a, a really uh, exciting announcement um, from the U.S. Department of Energy when they released their uh, blueprint to decarbonize America's building sector. This is uh, exciting news for anybody who's been involved in decarbonization in construction. And I just wanted to you know, highlight here that of the four elements that this, um, this blueprint is addressing, minimizing embodied life cycle emissions is um, you know, one of those four. And the, the targets that are being set are pretty dramatic. Uh, they're looking for 90% reductions by 2050. So, um, you know, if, if, if we or anybody involved here um, was wondering, you know, should we really be pursuing embodied emissions in our, uh, in our new homes? I think this really points to the fact that yes, we do. And yes, we're going to uh, need to and want to do that pretty aggressively. So the reason for wanting to start Home Builders Can, I'm a home builder myself. That's I come from a 25 year background in the uh, in the residential design build sector. And so I know from experience that quite often when um, policies, when when new sort of ways to try to leverage change on home builders come about, it often comes from outside the home building community. And I think within the home building community, we're really capable of taking the lead here and you know, learning ourselves how to understand, measure, report, and act on embodied carbon so that we come up with ways that we can do this you know, quickly, well, affordably, and, uh, and sort of really embed this in our practice and, 
and sort of lead on things like policy, lead on things like, you know, how we should be doing this, why we should be doing this, what sort of benchmarks we should be hitting. So the idea is to really, you know, uh, help the home building community take that lead and make embodied carbon one of the issues that uh, that we're sort of um, in control of and, and leading on. We kind of have three different um, ways that we're hoping to help home builders do that. One is to really dial in on increasing the embodied carbon performance of a new home or a whole portfolio of new homes. So that's you know learning how to do the measurement using standards and tools, identifying where the hot spots for embodied carbon are in your home designs and learning how to address those, developing reporting strategies that allow you to sort of say where you're at, demonstrate where you're going, and then you know highlight what you're achieving so that your your buyers and and other stakeholders really know and understand and can see what it is you're doing. Secondly, we want to really make sure that the focus stays on um, making sure that home builders remain profitable, that homes remain affordable as we sort of build and scale low embodied carbon strategies. So there's a whole track in in home builders can for that. And then finally, and it's not uh, last uh, and least, it's just uh, the third thing, is, is we really want to help the home builders uh, advocate for alignment across the whole sector. So um, as embodied carbon starts to get integrated into energy efficiency and green building programs, um, as cities and states decide to try to regulate embodied carbon, um, we really want to be advocating for a consistent approach an approach that works for home builders um, and an approach that can sort of really demonstrate uh, a level of performance that matches the needs of whatever sector we're uh, interfacing with. So those are kind of the, the three buckets of, of, uh, of activities and actions that we'll be taking with Home Builders Can. To, to support that, we have a full slate of activities scheduled for the first year of Home Builders Can starting with today's public launch and the air tightness study. Um, you can sort of see there's a, a whole bunch of things. Uh, almost every two weeks, there's an event. Some of them are public, the ones that are, are noted there. Uh, most of them are for members. So that's one of the reasons we'd love to have you join Home Builders Can is it will give you access to, uh, to all of this content, all of these round tables, all of these learning opportunities, including things like features on case studies. So having builders who have already achieved low embodied carbon homes, talk about that, get into the nuts and bolts of how they did that. Climate disclosure for home builders, um, a great session on how to measure embodied carbon using the BEAM tool, um, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of great activities. You can sort of scan that list there. You, you'll find the list on our website as well. In particular, I'd love to call out the fact that we'll be having the first ever um, embodied carbon summit for home builders as part of the EBA conference in early October. So if you're already uh, an attendee of EBA, you can sign on to, uh, to join us there in person. You can also just decide to join us in person and you don't have to uh, be an EBA member, um, but we really wanna sort of try to bring together, have at least one opportunity a year to meet in person and, uh, and really push the agenda along. So it's a, it's a great lineup of activities. Uh, I hope as you're scanning this list, you're finding things that sort of interest you and excite you and uh, and that you'll join up and uh, and join us for some or potentially all of these things. Other resources that we'll have uh, available to the public on our website, we're building up a library of case studies. I think there's four of them there now, but we will continuously be uh, finding and publishing new case studies on low embodied carbon buildings. If you're listening today and you are a builder and you think that you have a, a, a good home um, to be a case study, by all means, please reach out and talk to us. For members, we'll also be able to provide you with a custom consultation. So, you know, helping you develop your, your reduction plans, uh, custom training, some templates for reporting, the reports that we're going to publish, you know, the idea is to, to be a real resource center here. And I want to give a, a quick nod to the the to our sponsor Breakthrough Energy, who is uh, making all of this possible, and uh, because of their generous support, there's no cost to be a member of Home Builders Can. So, 
um, all of the 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 activities that uh, that come with membership at this point come with with no cost. So uh, thanks to Breakthrough Energy for making that possible. And I also want to give a quick shout out here to the early supporters of Home Builders Can. We've been having some soft launch activity since last fall and working with uh, a lot of folks in the industry to help craft what Home Builders Can looks like. And so this is um, the, the group of folks who, who signed on early. Uh, we hope that by the end of this webinar and over the next few months that, that this list will, uh, will grow quite a bit. But we're glad to have such leaders in the, uh, in the home building industry already part of uh, Home Builders Can and really helping us um, develop the kinds of uh, programs and the kinds of information and the kinds of resources that home builders want and need to address their embodied carbon. So at this point, um, we wanted to lead off this, uh, this introductory webinar to Home Builders Can with a look at the kinds of resources that we're hoping to continue to present to you as home builders. This one is a study on the impacts of addressing air tightness in buildings and how you can, there's a win-win. I think a lot of times people think that, that embodied carbon and operational carbon are somehow at odds with each other. And that in addressing one, you often um, you know, have an inverse effect on the other and vice versa. And so we really wanted to kick off with this air tightness study as an example of a win-win of a strategy where you can be addressing your operational emissions from a new home and your embodied carbon emissions from a new home. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy to present the overview of that study. Thank you, Chris, and welcome everybody. Um, what I do wanted to lead with is uh, first this air tightness study, like Chris said, is gonna be one of many reports and resources that we're excited to pull together and, and publish for this community. Um, but that uh, the report for this specific study will probably be available sometime later this year. So please keep a lookout for that. Um, there's no uh, public publication available currently, but as uh, Chris mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and the slides will be provided so you will have access to that. So uh, as Chris said, um, you know, we wanted to kick off Home Builders Can on a, on a very positive note, but also highlight the kind of strategies and opportunities there are for home builders to um, have these win-win opportunities uh, at hand. One of which is, uh, as Chris mentioned, that if energy efficiency uh, and embodied carbon performance are not in opposition. So on the next slide, um, we'll hopefully, we're looking forward to walk you through some of the analysis results that we found so far. And what we wanted to prove or explore in the study is that airtight construction is a really effective strategy for both improving the energy efficiency of the home and overall uh, contributing very minimally to increasing embodied carbon impacts in a home. So there are many more strategies, of course, for improvement in energy efficiency and reductions in embodied carbon, but this is a really sweet spot in terms of um, making really great impacts in both areas uh, without negative impacts in, um, in them as well. So uh, on the next slide, what uh, first part of our study was looking at a research paper um, sponsored by the Department of Energy that looked at the impact of air tightness in residential buildings on energy consumption. So the analysis took into account um, all the climate zones in the US, looking at 52 major cities uh, in, in the US and also uh, five cities in Canada. And they uh, based their study off of a energy code model prototype home. Uh, some of the specifications, which I list here to give you a bit of context about what was examined. It's a typical two-story single family home uh, with a square footage, uh, an area of about 2,400 square feet, um, two windows on each side, a roof, you know, typical construction specifications like wood stud framing. Um, and of course the insulation specifications that are according to the energy code models, which 
Uh, the link is provided here to be able to see more details on that in addition to the authors and the title of the original report. So on the next slide, what we wanted to do was look at the results directly from the study. So with this table here, uh, this is no numbers from our own. These are drawn directly from the report, which has all of this information for all of the climate zones that were examined. The one, just picking one out of the blue, uh, represented here is uh, climate zone 3A, or close to Dallas, Texas, which is actually where I'm from. And the study itself looks at the energy consumption for three major air tightness performance levels. Um, the first being a very leaky building, so a, a presumably no air barrier or otherwise 13 air changes per hour. Um, and the, the second level performance looks at what's closer to code minimum or uh, five air changes per hour at uh, 50 Pascal's pressure differential. Pressure differential. Um, and then finally, it looks at a very, very uh, airtight building to passive house standards, um, putting us at 0.6 air changes per hour. Um, so there are those three major air tightness level performances and the study goes through and looks at the annual energy consumption in uh, electricity and also in natural gas for this prototype home in multiple climate zones. And what was really interesting to us is to see what that percent energy improvement is simply from a change in the air tightness performance. So here, for example, in natural gas, going from uh, no air barrier to code minimum, you see about a 31% improvement in uh, an energy consumption. And then going from code minimum to passive house, uh, an additional 26% from that code minimum performance. So not a negligible improvement. Um, on the next slide, we're uh, just grabbing another example just to, to see uh, from a different climate zone, 5B, which puts us up in, in Massachusetts. And again, um, for example, in the natural gas line, um, we'll see a similar range of the reduction of annual energy consumption um, going from uh, the different levels of air tightness performance. And I did want to note here that these reductions are, are based off of annual, annual energy consumption and not operational carbon, uh, which is something that we'll get to a little later on. Um, so on the next slide, we uh, started looking into embodied carbon. Now embodied carbon isn't part of the original DOE paper, but uh, we were able to have a sense of what that percentage of energy performance uh, uh, increases are with just air tightness. And uh, so what we did was made an embodied carbon mo model of that DOE prototype home, assuming typical construction materials like industry average concrete and brick cladding and uh, et cetera, um, but using all the specifications that have been outlined according to the DOE energy prototype model. Um, and we came uh, to a total of about 32 tons of uh, CO2e for this home and an idea of the emissions intensity per square meter. Um, and the, for us, the, this gives us a starting point just to understand, okay, what the interventions are if you wanted to improve your air tightness, what you know, percentage does that look like in context to the home's total embodied carbon footprint. Um, so with here, just to specify that it's a cradle to gate embodied emission. So these emissions are the uh, ones associated with the materials that you're using in the building for, uh, that you're using in constructing the home. Um, so on the next slide, what uh, we're, the comparison and, and understanding that we're trying to get here is what that embodied carbon impact is when we're going from, let's say, a home with no air barrier, so a very leaky home, to one 
that uh, is meeting code minimum. And with the DOE study, we've seen that, you know, that results in about a 27 or 30 percent energy uses reduction. Um, and presumably that's what you get when you're adding a membrane, which the impact and contact to the total home, the home's total carbon footprint is about 2 percent of uh, additional to your cradle to gate embodied carbon, which is an addition, but of course is uh, relatively small in the context of the, the home's total carbon footprint. Um, and in the next slide, if we take it a step further and go from code minimum to a passive house air tightness uh, performance level, again, from the DOE studies, you see the range of energy usage reduction anywhere in the 20, mid 20% 20 um, reduction range. And here the interventions are less about a significant addition of material. So noting like approximately zero addition to embodied carbon here, because we're looking at primarily on-site installation interventions. So of course, um, like, connection detailing, making sure things are properly installed, making sure you're minimizing and sealing gaps. So of course, like there are extra tapes um, and, and, and some materials here, but they're relatively negligible for uh, compared to other types of interventions. And I did want to make a note here that, you know, material costs aren't everything. Um, we like going from code minimum to passive house air tightness standards does require more on-site labor. We know that labor can be expensive and that's definitely a uh, part of the report that will be published, an aspect that we'll look into and provide more um, details on to make sure that we're not neglecting that very important aspect for home builders. Um, and uh, so far, you know, we can see that increases for um, ultra, like the super airtight homes to pass about standards that are of course, more labor costs. But what we've seen so far is that the costs for materials and labor are generally less than 1% of the total cost for a typical single family home. So um, we'll follow up uh, with more details on that in the final report, so stay tuned. But definitely wanted to make sure that um, it's an aspect that we acknowledge and uh, will definitely be touched on in the final study. So, um, I guess uh, before moving on, I wanted to, Chris, give you an opportunity to add any more commentary here, or let's say on the next slide with our final summary. Um, I think, well, I'm actually, maybe I'll stay back here. I think, you know, just the, the thing that really stands out, and I, I don't think this is news to anybody in, in the home building space, but just you know that that the amount of difference when you start to to make a building more airtight you know when we look at a number like 23% or 26% i mean that's a that's a huge achievement in energy efficiency and to be able to achieve that without incurring much or any uh, additional embodied carbon i mean that's you know we thought we might find that going in and uh, and it was you know really really great to to be able to find that and i think you're about to look at some um, real world examples that we found for the study to, to kind of confirm that a bit more. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, perfectly uh, sets me up for uh, the second part to the study, which I'll try to go through quickly to make sure that we save plenty of time for our amazing panelists. But the previous study by the DOE looked at energy performance and what we were particularly interested as a part of Home Builders Plan is the operational carbon part of the story. So we looked at six different energy models of homes in Massachusetts with varying typologies and energy performance levels and also varying performance in embodied carbon. Um, and from these models, we were able to have the information about the annual operational carbon uh, in, ton, in terms of tons of CO2 per year. So on the next slide, <clears throat> we wanted to keep the climate variables in those models constant while varying the air tightness performance from let's say code minimum uh, air changes per hour to uh, passive house air, air tightness performance standard. And we saw 
a similar range uh, and also notable savings in annual operational carbon um, per, per year with this uh, scenario modeling analysis. Um, so to reiterate, going, for example, from code minimum of five air changes per hour to an even tighter building uh, or uh, at three air changes per hour, we saw an average of 13% average reduction in annual operational carbon. And we repeated that exercise going from five air changes to an even tighter air, uh, air tightness performance level. Um, so the range is uh, um, very uh, luckily similar to what we observed in the DOE studies um, and uh, meeting about that mid 20% uh, up and upwards to 30% savings in operational carbon, which is which is really exciting to see. Um, but I, before I move on, I just wanted to especially uh, thank Andy, Patrick, and Jacob for their analysis and support and expertise in this study. Um, uh, of course, we'll be providing more details in the final report. But one thing that I, we wanted to note here is, like as Chris said, that, you know, that 25% savings in uh, operations or energy energy usage is significant, but significant to what degree? So we wanted to put that savings into more context. Um, and on the next slide, we wanted to list it next to some other more common interventions that uh, the community may be used to. So the first two columns here are showing, you know, the what we've seen before with just moving from uh, increasing the air tightness of the building and what that results in, in terms of operational carbon savings, um, noting that the embodied carbon impact is negligible due to not much material, not much significant material being added to the home. Um, and of course, if you look at upgrading windows, for example, from double to triple pane, you'll see somewhere around 10% uh, increase in operational carbon in performance. But that comes, of course, with an excuse me, embodied carbon impact of anywhere from two to 8%, depending on ex what exact type of windows you have and how many you have in your building. And similarly, uh, doubling uh, exterior wall insulation thickness um, has around the, a range of, let's say, 8-ish percent in operational carbon uh, reduction annually. And that could range, um, of course, from a 6 to 30% increase in the cradle to gate embodied carbon impacts. Um, and it, I think the results here were really interesting just to see that air tightness uh, as a strategy is, is really, uh, really impactful. Of course, you know, upgrading your windows and making sure you have sufficient insulation are really important strategies. Um, and there are also opportunities to minimize embodied carbon with them. So the range I'm noting here are just looking at the swath of typical materials. Um, but of course, if you start looking at carbon storing materials and so on, that uh, that intervention can actually have a, a really, really impactful event in both operational and embodied. But um, and they also come with additional improvements in other aspects besides carbon and energy in terms of human comfort and, and indoor air quality, et cetera. So all of these strategies do lead to um, better enclosures overall, which is still the goal here. Um, but we just wanted to make sure to highlight that air tightness is especially effective um, when looking at the, at the embodied carbon impact. So I'll uh, end on the next slide with uh, summarizing this exciting win-win um, result that we're seeing with this air tightness study that improving air tightness is the best improvement in improving operating emissions for the least increase in embodied emissions, let's say on, uh, a, a, on a more overall general level without getting into super nitty gritty specifics about material specifications. Um, so I'll leave that there and uh, pass it back on to Chris for any closing remarks on the study or to uh, lead us into the panel discussion. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Tracy. 
Uh, I hope everybody found that interesting. I think our panelists are likely to pick up on some of those points so we can uh, continue the discussion a bit there. Um, but I just want to point out that, you know, we we chose this to lead off with Home Builders Can because, you know, this is the kind of thing that we want to be doing for home builders is sort of um, being able to, to do the research, do the studies, kind of give you the information and then help you think it through and digest it and figure out how this might inform your own decarbonization strategies moving forward. So looking forward to being able to publish that final report. Uh, there will be you know, a lot more detail for you to dig in in the published report, but hopefully this has whet your appetite um, for this particular topic and the kinds of things we're going to be working on at Home Builders Can. So with that, I'm going to uh, kick us off into the uh, panel discussion portion. So the, the last half of our webinar will be uh, our fine panelists uh, talking about this. We're going to be joined by Paula Melton from Building Green, Beverly Craig from Mass CEC, Eric Whirling from Home Innovation Strategies, and Andrew Guido from Empire Communities. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll have each of them introduce themselves in order. And then Tracy, you can kick us off with some uh, a question to get the discussion going. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paula Melton. Um, thank you so much, Chris and Tracy, for inviting me to be here. Um, I work at Building Green, um, where we have three main ways of kind of leading the industry on climate and many other green building issues. Um, we have publishing, direct consulting, and we convene networks of sustainability leaders across AEC. I primarily direct our publications, um, which are the Building Green Report, um, which for any old timers used to be known as Environmental Building News, and also our lead user tool. Um, and I kind of got here in a weird way. I started as a poet, um, somehow ended up in socially responsible marketing for a decade or so, and then came to Building Green in 2011. Um, in the 20 teens, Building Green started to get way more serious about embodied carbon as a super urgent climate priority um, alongside operational carbon resilience and climate equity concerns. Um, so my particular interest in this topic has to do um, in this moment right now with the intersections that we need to be seeing um, between like um, what we need to do sustainability wise and our current national housing crisis that's really pinching people and, you know, like literally putting people out on the street. Um, so I'd love to understand better how we can kind of thread the needle on housing affordability in ways that optimize for embodied, operational, and um, a carbon and then equitable health and wellness as well. So thanks for having me. Great. Thanks. Um, Beverly, do you want to go next? Hi, everybody. I'm Beverly Craig with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. So we're a quasi state government agency. So think like energy office in a lot of people's states. Um, we're very interested in embodied carbon because we think we've been extremely focused on operational energy and not enough on embodied carbon. So um, one of the things we're doing is an embodied carbon challenge uh, for larger buildings. And I bet about a half of the submissions that will be coming in on Wednesday will be multifamily projects. Um, I hope all of you will vote on your favorite high impact, low cost embodied carbon uh, reductions that you see in those. I'm sure we'll, we'll get the word out through Chris and the RMI team about that. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work around uh, uh, concrete transparency since concrete's the second most used material after water worldwide uh, and it's really got high on uh, embodied carbon impacts. Uh, so in Massachusetts, we've been funding grants to our ready mix uh, concrete producers so that they can uh, provide uh, EPDs for every mix that they produce. So that gives builders like you the tools to be able to ask for better uh, greenhouse gas versions of whatever performance you need for your concrete. Um, and like Paula, I come from, well, I'm very interested in the affordability crisis because I come from an affordable housing background. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's great to, to have that be very centered in this conversation. So I'm glad you're both here to bring that up. Uh, Eric, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, it's it's really cool to be part of this mixed group here. 
Um, today is uh, my first, uh, you know, sort of official uh, uh, capacity um, as the owner of Home Innovation Strategies. But most of your audience who has heard of me will know of me as the Building America Program Director and the Zero Energy Ready Homes Program Director at the Department of Energy. I just ended up my 30 year public service career in December, retiring from the federal service, but I still got a lot of life left in me. So um, I've decided to continue the work, um, pretty much the same sort of stuff I did through the last 12 years at the Department of Energy built without all the government baggage. So uh, I'm gonna try and help to promote uh, and help specific clients who appreciate the need for integrated strategies to promote the use of innovations to help us make our homes better. Because I firmly believe that uh, we need to evolve our relationship with the planet, one. Two, I believe that our homes are the most important part of that uh, equation. I mean, you can do the numbers, but when it comes right down to it, we spend most of our lives in our homes and it affects our life more than any other aspect of our economy. Uh, and so I'm sticking with homes. That's, that's, that's where I feel at home. <laughs> and finally, the strategies that are needed to make our homes better for both people and planet have to uh, consider uh, all of the different players and aspects of uh, this this huge challenge of decarbonizing our economy. Um, I mean, there's policy uh, influencing governments, influencing standards, uh, helping researchers to get good ideas out into the marketplace, which is really hard, helping builders to make ends meet and manage the change that's required to to bring innovation into their operations, that's all critical and not very many people are expert in all of those areas. So I'm hoping to help a lot of organizations who want to do that. Embodied carbon itself is an issue that's been on my radar for a long, long time, but we have never really had the opportunity to embrace it as part of our priorities in the Department of Energy until yesterday when the DOE published the uh, first blueprint for decarbonizing the uh, building sector. That's a super exciting culmination. Kind of bummed that it happened three months after I left, but still, it's a continuation of the work that I uh, made a career out of, and I'm really excited that embodied carbon is now on the playbook. Uh, in fact, that... I think an earlier slide, Chris, you said, uh, the DOE said, we want to reduce embodied carbon emissions of, of construction activities by 90% in, in the next 25 years. So that's a, a that's a really big deal. There's a lot of challenges because uh, the standards aren't really clear yet, et cetera. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think it's probably daunting, but also exciting for the early uh, uh, entrance to the to this field you know the builders that have joined your your initiative already are clearly skating to where the puck is going and i'm real excited about all of that and just uh that you didn't wait till government uh you know was ready to participate to get this going so that's also really exciting and thanks for all that great thank you for that and uh, that's a pretty good lead in uh, for Andrew, who over at uh, Empire Communities uh, is one of the builders who who are sort of stepping in to uh, to, to you know do this uh, ahead of regulation and ahead of the curve. So take it away, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Chris, for inviting me to this panel. This is really exciting and happy to meet everybody that's on the panel. Uh, Empire Communities is uh, in the top 100 builders in the U.S. market. We're also in the Canadian market. Uh, we're fairly significant in the market that we play in. In Ontario, we're the largest builder in southern Ontario, um, uh, where we cover a lot of a lot of ground. Um, so I, I head up sustainability and innovation, and I hold a unique uh, designation, far too unique, uh, to be honest with you. I wish there were more people. So I'm a building biologist. 
certified by the Building Biology Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, we worry about uh, both the indoor and outdoor uh, environment because um, if it's no good outdoors, it's no good indoors and vice versa uh, on, on that side of it. Uh, as many of you know, we live more than half of our lives inside. And it's amazing to see what just putting up a wall over dirt can do to the indoor environment, to create microclimates. And so I'm really interested in studying all this impact and uh, what we can do as a builder that serves the mass market. So, you know, we have affordability or attainability as a, um, a threshold that we can't, you know, we can't surpass. We can do all kinds of crazy stuff for your niche markets, but if we're trying to help society overall, we're trying to do this within a frame that everybody can afford. Great, thanks. Well, this is, uh, if you're listening in, you know now that we've got a bunch of great perspectives and uh, do you wanna kick us off, Tracy, with our first question for the panel? Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Paula, Bev, Eric, Andrew, again, for taking the time to join us. We're really thrilled to have you here. and. Uh, First uh, panelist question for today is that we've we've seen with the air tightness study that specifically for home builders can we're going to focus first on improving embodied embodied carbon performance, but without compromising operational efficiency and and also operational emissions. So um, the question we want to talk about here is how do you see these two aspects? combining in your own line of work. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, Andrew, seeing that you've just freshly spoken and are freshly off mute, maybe I'll um, hand it to you first and uh, let Paula, Bev, and Eric jump in after you. Thanks, Tracy. That was a polite way of saying it. Forgot to mute. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I take a very interesting perspective on all this because I worry about um, just... Um, trying to achieve uh, one thing without realizing the impact on something else. So when I look at sustainability and I look at air tightness, and I look at, you know, um, the upfront carbon, which is the embodied carbon that we bring in, the pursuit of that alone without thinking about the human consequences of what, you know, off-gassing and other things off could offset, you know, create unwanted consequences. Uh, so, you know, when I look at, look at things, I try to find those materials that, um, are beneficial for both uh, occupants and for the, pla the planet. And generally speaking, if the materials are healthy, they're probably good for the planet too. Uh, so, you know, they're less processed and there's more and more of this stuff becoming more commonly available where it's been months trying to find stuff. I can find it now fairly quickly. So if you, you, know, if you look for it, you'll find it. Go ahead, Paula. Yeah, I was just so excited to see um, the results of this study. And the most intriguing piece for me in terms of moving forward, um, sort of like as a creator of resources for building green, like the big takeaway for me is that we really need to be focusing on builders and trades um, for boosting the air tightness without extra embodied carbon. Um, and I just wonder, like I'd love to understand more about how, um, you know, our resources or, you know, resources we could help create um, with others could support those those outcomes from um, the building, the builder community. Yeah, I think you're really onto something. I think, you know, when you think about the air tightness in particular, that intervention is really, you know, the study shows it's not an embodied carbon intervention. It's really a people intervention. It's, you know, you've already you've already hung this sheet barrier up all around the house and the difference between that five air changes and that one or that point six is what are the people on site doing to make the most of of that barrier and so yeah that you know in this case the strategy is really about the people on site and and it's not a, a material strategy uh, per se and so yeah i think i think you know getting getting people interested in, involved in, and trained to make buildings airtight is really, is really important. And I, I'll just throw in a, a quick, you know, thing for the, the very last project that I was involved in in 2020, we were actually the airtightness consultants on a project at Trent University. And the, the, the GC company was just a conventional GC company 
air tightness was not on their radar at all. And when we first started to talk to them about all these things, like the building had a goal to hit the 0.6, like we were actually aiming for passive house, you know, results. And so there was a lot of eye rolling and a lot of like moans and like, oh, you know, do we have to do this? But what was really interesting is when the when the blower door came the first time and those those folks on site were sort of like in real time seeing a result, finding a leak, sealing the leak and seeing the result get better. They got really into it and uh, and really on board with it. And I think that there's a sort of gamification that can happen with air tightness that that I think, you know, it's it can seem like a big challenge to try to get you know, all of these builders who who haven't been thinking about this to do it. But but on site, we really watched that happen. And they were really pumped to hit that 0.6. Actually, they, they did better than that. And we're proud to have done better. So I think that, you know, it's a it's an interesting thing that it's it's more about the, the people than than material strategies when it when it comes right down to it in this particular uh, case. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I, I want to um get back to uh, Tracy's question specifically about the uh, the apparent maybe conflict or the space between embodied carbon and energy efficiency. And I want to make my answer a bit philosophical and also historical. Looking back on my career 30 years ago when we started with, when I started with supporting the Energy Star Homes program, we were focused you know, exclusively on how can we realistically with existing technologies makes home, homes 30% more efficient. That's all we were worried about is operational efficiency. Over the years, what we found is that you can't just do that. To Andrew's point, as soon as you make one change in a house, like you tighten up the building, now you have to worry about indoor quality issues. And so we spent more than a decade working on those problems in Building America and Energy Star and later the Indoor Air Plus program at EPA, et cetera. And, and so what we did is, in my view, we evolved the industry and we did it with the industry, you know, with us. I mean, we all, builders were a critical part of making those programs successful over time. And they eventually embraced uh, air tightness. Air tightness now in homes is way better than it was 30 years ago when we started. Indoor air quality is also better than it was, even though the first attempts to tighten up buildings led to some indoor air quality issues. So what we've done is we've evolved and gotten better. We've gotten better at measuring the performance that's important to us. Now when we add embodied carbon emissions, that's another set of criteria for our optimization problem. It's not actually different. It's just evolving the challenge towards more and more sophisticated approaches to how do we make the best homes that we can and how do we do it efficiently? So to me, it's not a conflict at all. It's just an extension of the same problem that we've had all along, which is every time you make a change, you have to understand what the impacts are. And every time you improve the performance target, you also, you're going to make changes and therefore you're going to have to do that iterative back and forth change management process. So that's the way I look at this. Uh, I don't see it as a conflict at all. I see it as a puzzle. It's an optimization problem that we have to help the building community to do efficiently and profitably. Yeah, yeah if I can add, sorry, go ahead. Chris. No, go ahead. Yeah, so if I can add to that, Eric and, uh, I appreciate all the work that you've done in, in this area uh, itself. You know, we're an energy star builder in several of the markets that we're in, where we're evolving to all the to that point to all the markets. You can't get there from here just with uh, achieving energy star and going to the next level. It takes um, re, it, it takes design changes in order to be able to remove all of the potential leakage points. Sadly, the easiest envelope to uh, to make our tight is a square or a rectangle. Uh, as, as soon as you start pointing out and putting no notches, windows, right? <laughs> yeah, with no windows, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and this is where, you know, we want, you know, we're, we're uh, um, you know, excited uh, when we see the outdoors and we have beautiful uh, spaces in you know, an area called biophilia, uh, man's love or woman's love for nature. Uh, and so the tough part of this whole mission is, you know, up, the 
is it's going to require redesign. That's a, that's a major hurdle, um, you know, because we're going to have to rethink how we build and what we do as a result of it. Well, I'll say a lot of this rings true to me for sure. And uh, our state agency gave grants to eight uh, multifamily projects between 30 and 100 units to upgrade to passive house. And you didn't see actually a lot more insulation. You saw a much bigger focus on air tightness. That was the biggest thing. And then much better ventilation. Those are like the two big places. Um, and the cost on the air tightness was a training issue. And I will say most of the subs, it was sort of new to them, but it was gamified. And it's like really incredible to have the quality running a blower door more, much more often than you would typically is very insightful, especially like coming up to midpoint before you're gonna put any sheetrock up or anything. Like you find things you're like, wow, no idea that this was happening. Um, so I do think the general contractors that we work with on those projects generally thought that once they had trained people and gotten people used to it, they weren't gonna go back. I also think that's a really important, um, it's, it's a better way of building. It has less durability issues in the long term if you have controlled, uh, you, you know, you're, you're controlling the air and where the moisture is going. So uh, quality, I do think ventilation is really starts. important to focus on when you do go to higher air tightness. Um, but I will say if there's anything we learned in COVID, it's that we should be ventilating better. And people like, filtered fresh air that they can control. So as long as we can teach them how to change the filters, we're good. Yeah, I almost wonder if we're kind of like, if we can see a silver lining to this sort of worker shortage problem we've been having that like, when as we're training up, you know, younger people, newer people to the trades, like we can teach them a new way of doing things. Um, and they're, you know, they're going to be younger people, millennials and Zoomers who really, really want to be involved in climate solutions. So I think it's kind of exciting. Yeah, I think one of the things that that we'll see, too, is, you know, air tightness isn't a big sort of it's not a mystery, you know, <laughs> like the, the air leaks kind of from the same places all the time. And that that once you've gone through that training, often the first training is going and fixing all of the things you didn't do the first time. But your second, third, fourth time out, what you start to learn is if I take care of this at the time, then it's not something I have to go back and, and tape or patch or caulk, you know, when I finally do the blower door test. So I think, I think, you know, the curve from not knowing it at all to starting to learn it to doing a great job can actually be pretty steep because it's not, it's not that difficult. And once once you've been at a few blower door tests and you know where those vulnerable places are, you're gonna you're gonna tackle them before they're a problem. And uh, and I think you know the the crews that that have had a focus on air tightness, they now whip those things off, and and there isn't you know that much increase in 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 time or cost by the you know fourth, fifth, sixth time around. Um, well, I think this panel is just fantastic and we can stay on this topic and discussion for the entirety of the hour, but um, I know we, we have maybe just, we want one minute for closing remarks, so that leaves us uh, doing the math a couple more minutes for maybe one one last question um, and maybe a, a quick spiel from, from all four of our amazing panelists here. Um, and, and we'll end with an easy one of, you know, what excites you the most about home builders can now, let's say transitioning from air tightness study to uh, what this launch event is actually about um, and uh, what you're most excited about and how, uh, how do you see it benefiting your work? I can jump in. So I, I am super excited to see so many new products and especially bio-based products coming onto the market. And I wanna see this group trying these out. I also, the products in my experience haven't actually been more expensive. I think this may be a way to make some things less expensive. So, um, you know, everything in our region, we have HP Timber coming on, which is, you know, wood fiber insulation, including exterior 
uh, installation. That's really exciting. Like, wouldn't it be lovely to see a zip integrated HP like product, right? Um, seeing um, these uh, foam glass gravel products that can get rid of XPS. You have sort of a combined gravel and uh, insulation, like that's really exciting. And that has definitely been less expensive in our market in Massachusetts, but it's doing things a different way. And, but it's less trades that you have to coordinate to, which is a really nice thing. Um, and I just see, I mean, concrete, one of the companies that we fund in Massachusetts is called Sublime. That is potentially zero carbon concrete. Um, that's a drop-in replacement for for Portland cement. So like there's so much coming and very quickly, but, and it may not be more expensive, a lot of this stuff. What a cool name, Sublime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. And that is, you know, that focus on new materials, uh, home builders can, some of our webinars are gonna be having those companies introducing their materials to the builders. And, you know, we'll help facilitate um, builders who want to use those products in, you know, prototypes and demo homes. So yeah, that's, thanks, Bev. That's great. Um, I'd, yeah, like go ahead. To, I'd like to follow Bev if I could, because I think she uh, just teed me up by starting straight off in, in the technology innovation space by some of the exciting innovations that are happening. And I want to add and, and sort of beef up Bev's point, which is the innovation is happening really fast in the technology space. I'm I'm seeing the acceleration happening, you know, with with uh, Department of Energy. I'm I'm a, a reviewer of some of the new FOA, um, you know, uh, envelope uh, proposals, which I can't talk about. But there's there's some very exciting developments in the innovation space. That leads me to why I'm excited about Home Builders Can because the innovation is happening probably faster than builders could possibly uh, be ready for. And builders are going to need to have a support infrastructure and network that helps to figure out more quickly than in the past what are going to be the impacts of trying these new technologies. And they can't do it by themselves. They need to have a support network. And, you know, certainly the government could get around to providing that kind of structure and I certainly hope the DOE will and the EPA, et cetera. Um, but without waiting for the government, RMI has stepped in and started this initiative with a whole bunch of support from a lot of different organizations. That to me is the exciting part because it's going to enable the tools and resources and support that home builders are going to need to increase the chain, the pace at which they innovate in their with their products because that's inherently a risky business proposition and they need all the help they can get i, I agree with that if i can jump in uh, eric and i think it's going to take all of us to uh influence the supply chain um and to uh let the um, manufacturers know this is what we're requiring we need the epds we need the hpds we need better performing products itself we can't test all of it uh, so, you know, this forum would create uh, um, a great learning opportunity. Um, you know, I built one concept home focused on wellness and building another concept home focused on net zero and really excited about uh, the other ones that were going to go. I think airtightness is really the ante to get into a better performing uh, home. We still got a long ways to go if we're going to deal with uh, resilience. And, uh, you know, and if we don't deal with resilience, we're going to have people that can't get mortgages. We can't get insurance. Uh, in, you know, client sensitive areas. So, you know, we've got a big challenge is we want to try and put people into homes uh, um, and the, the pace of innovation hopefully will help us get there. Right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll give you the final word, Paula, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Yeah, I'm super excited actually about Timber HP, um, which I know everybody here is also excited about. It's great to hear that the, um, the foam glass style gravel is like really living up to its promise of being cheaper. Um, and I just wanted to like, first of all, I wanna say like, we know that bio-based um, materials are not necessarily inherently carbon neutral, like um, some people have, have been touting, but there are ways to ensure that we minimize the embodied carbon of those. 
Um, and it's exciting to see even like concrete um, making huge strides in um, reaching um, carbon neutrality and doing some carbon storage. Um, I know there's some work going on in Maine at the University of Maine right now where they're working a lot with bio-based materials and um, really cool. And um, people should definitely look into that. Um, so thanks for thanks for the talk, it was great. Yeah, thanks to, uh, to all of you for joining us. I'm just going to uh, pop my screen back up here as we sign off. Thanks to everybody who joined us today. We really appreciate you taking this hour and now uh, a couple extra minutes to uh, to hear what we had to say with Home Builders Can and with this panel. Uh, we would really love to have you join us. So there's the link there to sign up as a, as a member, or you can just subscribe. You don't have to become a member right away, but if you subscribe, you'll get uh, our updates and our information. And you can use the QR code here to, uh, to access the recording from today's webinar. Um, thanks to uh, all involved here at RMI and our panelists and, uh, and all of you who took the time to be here. We really look forward to seeing you at future Home Builders Can events. Have a great rest of your day.